Awesome. Well, I appreciate you having me in today. Uh, looking forward to the opportunity to get a chance to talk some ball in this crazy time. So uh, my name is Drew Nystrom. I'm the offensive coordinator and online coach here at John Carroll University. Um, you know, my email address is there at the bottom. I'll give my uh, cell phone out at the end of it, too, if you need to. Um, but, um, you know, this is my second. This will be my second season at, at John Carroll. Um, last year, I was a run game coordinator, O-line coach. Um, got brought to John Carroll. One of my best friends from college was the offensive coordinator. Um, he took a job outside of coaching or, or resigned to be a full-time dad. And uh, uh, Coach Fanati was, uh, you know, was kind enough to elevate me to the offensive coordinator this year. So, um, you know, I, I hate when coaches do this, but just real brief background. I'm originally from the Crystal Lake, Illinois, uh, outside of the Chicagoland area from Prairie Ridge High School which has um, actually uh, turned into a powerhouse now. We weren't when I was there, but they are now. Um, and then what brought me to Ohio was I, was I was fortunate enough to get recruited to go to Bowling Green State University, um, where I played offensive line there for five seasons, ended up being a three-year starter. And uh, one of the few, very, very uh, few and fortunate that uh, was at a, a successful MAC program for five seasons, only had one head coach, one strength coach and two position coaches. Um, and I, I think that I was coached by two of the best in the country in Greg Sidrava, who's at Ohio State now, and Matt Campbell, who's at Iowa State now too. So um, those between those influences got me involved in coaching and, and gave me an opportunity at Wabash College where I was working with the tight ends and assisting with the offensive line. Um, and then from there, I, I kind of went on that standard uh, GA role that a lot of people go, bounce from a couple places from time to time took my first gig at uh, University of Dubuque in 2011, won the first conference championship there for uh, over 30 years there, um, then went to the University of Illinois, worked with Coach Beckman, uh, who I knew from uh, Bowling Green in my time there, and then uh, got, got engaged and hopped on back to University of Dubuque to take over as the offense coordinator there. I was fortunate enough to win another conference championship there and then ultimately come to John Carroll. But that's all I'll talk about that. I want to actually get into the meat and bones of what we want to talk about because uh, that's not what you, anyone one of us are here for. So uh, when you talk about the wide zone, and to, first off, I want to just talk about why, why you would run it. Um, and, and to me, a lot of it has to do with the offensive line personnel. Um, year in and year out, you know, you all, there's, a, there's always a standard set of schemes, in my opinion, that you, that you go into. You know you're going to kind of uh, make your money with one or two of them. Um, but what I found in my career is there's been certain years that certain players are a little bit more successful. Um, because of the offensive line personnel, um, also because of your running back personnel, what they're act, what they're good at running, uh, what they have, what they believe in. You know, in 2017, 2015, we ran the wide zone was was our top play when we won the league in 2015, and then 2017 we finished 20th in the country in rushing, and it was it was one and two back power, uh, and it's what our guys believed in. And I remember we we ended up running it in a scrimmage versus UW Oshkosh after they went to the national championship scored a touchdown from then on that's the play that every single one of our guys believe in so when you get the, the different type of personnel you know obviously if you have a a bigger beef your offensive line i think wide zone is going to be a struggle um, which is why we were heavier in 2017 we ran power so to me when you have lighter um, smaller offensive linemen that can emphasize technique to have the ability to run uh, to me that's going to fit really really well into the wide zone when you have a a running back who's really good at making one cut and then get back on his on his track um you know i think you have that or a bigger thicker body who you can get him going downhill and get without making too many cuts and he's taking hits on from the side as opposed to you know head on where they can bounce off then you're going to have a lot of success in wide zone too i think you know that to me um Derek Henry or, or whatever Henry is at, at the Titans, I would come to mind for that. So, and I think it's a really, really challenging um, play to fit defensively. I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, I turn on the film and we, that safety is having a really, really challenging task in trying to fit this play properly um, because it has the ability to hit in, in several different gaps. Um, and it's not clearly defined. Like I love pin and pull, but pin and pull is a little bit of an easier play to fit, in my opinion, from an offensive standpoint. I don't know defensively um, because you're defining the hole a little bit too much, and it's, it's, you're allowing um, defenders that you know that definition of where we're going, so they can fit it. Where in wide zone, it's not as clear of a picture for them to be able to fit and, and make a make a play on the running back when they have the ability to do so. Um, and then also, 
it's a limited negatives play with a lot of big play potential. Um, and then I think it's one of the reasons why I like wide zone quite a bit is you can run it out of all different personnel groupings. You can be in 12 personnel, you can be in 11, you can be in 21, and you can be in 20. And, and the big one is you can be in 10, not have a tight end on the field, and you can run this play because you don't have to account for the backside defense event because the aiming point is wide enough, far enough away from the backside that, you know, you really – you shouldn't run into too many defensive ends and be able to make a play off of it on the backside. And, and quite, quite honestly, to me, that's one of the things you're looking for. If that defensive end starts to make plays, well, you can run a naked off of it and run some of your play action off of it to be a counter uh, for the play, um, you know, as you're moving forward. So uh, just some of the logistics behind the play, the way that, that I would teach it, um, you know, going into it is the running back's aiming point would be the butt of the tight end. Um, if there's a tight end there on the line of scrimmage, if there isn't, then it would be the butt of the ghost tight end, right? So you're, you're, you're taking that aiming point right to the butt of the tight end. Um, the running back's read will be the end man on the line of scrimmage. And then his objective, I think the objective for the guys up front, and I think this is, is I had a conversation with another offense blind coach earlier, earlier this spring, you know, it's really to reach and seal the front side five technique or three technique as soon as possible. And then I and then I cut off backside pursuit. And, and to me, the if you have a guard who can reach effectively and stay on the line of scrimmage, not necessarily reach and get totally cut off a front side three technique, but if you have a guard who can reach the play side hip of the three technique and keep him on the line of scrimmage and keep him running, then you can run this play to any 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 front, right? If you struggle a little bit more so at the guard, then obviously you're going to want to try to try to manipulate it to where you can run into a shade and a five and have that front side tackle and guard combination. Um, but to me, that, that's one of the keys in terms of, you know, your personnel and how it affects the plays. If you, you know, that's one of the reasons why in 2015, this was the best play for us. Yeah, I had a right guard who was all region, first team all conference and was really, really good. A right tackle who was 240 pounds. Well, two, those two guys together could reach any five technique and any three technique and we had a ton of success running that play to the right. You know, we, we were solid to the left, but not as good. Um, you know, I had another first team all conference guard on that side and a second team all conference tackle, but the tackle was six foot five, 330 pounds, moved well, ended up having a, a mini camp trial with the Vikings, but wasn't quite as good as a play. So um, to me, that that's one of the things that I look at in terms of whether or not that play is going to be really, really, um, you know, successful for us moving forward. So, uh, now, to me, the way that I teach the base block, one of the things that I've done, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, I made this change probably about three or four years ago in my career in, in terms of coaching, but I, I, I no longer talk about, um, I no longer talk about the upper body. There's no, no upper body aiming points. Um, will ever be discussed as long as I'm an offensive line coach again. Uh, what we do is we tell them they, they're going to tip with, they're going to make an aiming point with their groin. They're, they're trying to get the tip of their groin or the tip of their small head, the one they think with more anyway. Uh, they're going to try to get the tip of their groin to an aiming point on the defender, right? And, and the thought process, one behind that is one, I want to make the game safer. You know, I don't ever want to talk about anything from the head up. I don't want to talk about getting a face mask to uh, via the neck or getting a face mask to the armpit or anything like that. Um, Cause to me, I, I want to get the head out of the game as much as we can. Um, and and uh, you know, that's one small thing that I can do um, and, and allow that to happen. And then the second reason is by going with the lower body aiming points, when you start talking about um, get your tip of your groin to the play side hip of the defender or tip of the groin to the near hip or whatever that may be, um, you're really talking about your center of gravity, your center of mass, right? So now it, it, we're allowing ourselves to get our hips in position and we're making a focus and making our players think about truly getting their hips to an aiming point, which is, is, which is how you're going to really create some movement, in my opinion, and, and finish blocks and do those type of things. And then the, the third benefit, and this wasn't one of the re initial reasons why I made the change. I made the initial change because I wanted to get the head out of the game and I wanted to get um, the players to start thinking about their center of mass being in the right place to make a play. Um, but the third benefit I've done and I've seen, and you'll see some of it in some of the clips coming up, is it allows them to do and work on their footwork and work on aiming points um, in 
solo situations in which they don't have a partner where I can put something on the ground where they can put something on the ground and use that as an aiming point and literally run over that aiming point and they can get there. So um, everything you, that you're going to hear from me in this, in the next 45 minutes or an hour is going to talk about tip to tip, tip to play side tip, whatever that may be, but it's going to be the tip of their groin is what we're referring to when I say tip. So if they're in a base block, if they're, if any situation that they're there and they're blocking that by themselves, this is what their aiming point will be. And it really is then going to end up being the same on, on wide zone for almost everything. But what, what I want to see them do is I want to see them get their tip to the play side hip of the defender, right? I want to see them get their backside hand to the sternum, right? And how you get to their, how you get your tip to the play side hip is I want to see the defender, we'll see it in some of our drills. I want to, I want to see the offensive lineman take a first step to the far foot of the defender. It could get a little bit of depth. It might be six inches. It might be eight inches. It all depends on the alignment of the defender. But I want to see that first step, step to the far foot of the defender. And I want to see that second step, step to the crotch, right? If you can take your first step, far foot, second step, crotch, your place, your tip will be at the play side hip of the defender, right? That's what we're looking for. And then any type of power is going to come from your backside hand and your backside knee, right? So you want to get that backside hand to the sternum. Your play side hand, I'll talk about this. I don't really I don't really coach up the play side hand anymore because it really just gets involved in penalties is what the play side hand does and a lot of blocks. So I'm really, really, really focused on getting that backside hand or the sternum and driving the backside knee through the crotch of the defender. So that's how we would execute a base block. Um, any of our comp play side combinations now. So when I talk about the lead combination, I'm talking about if you had a two-man combination, and you're, you're running a play to the right, obviously your right guard and center, the right guard's your lead, right? And your center's your trail. So that's how I, that's how I refer to things. Um, but your lead aiming point is gonna be the same deal. He's gonna step to his play side hip of the defender, right? And he's gonna take the same footwork that we were talking about before. He's gonna step far foot crotch in order to get his tip to the play side hip of the defender. The trail guy in the combination has the same exact aiming point. Right. Our goal is to get the down lineman reached and sealed as quickly as possible. So he's going to take the same footwork tip to the play side hip. Now, obviously, his footwork is going to be slightly different because his angle is different. Right. He'll probably get a little bit more depth on his first steps, uh, first step and potentially his third. But he's going to what, what I tell those guys and we'll get a chance to look at it in some of the film. They have three steps to make a decision. Right. They want to get and reach the play side hip of the down lineman in three steps. Right. And if they can reach them in three steps, they're going to they're going to make a go call. They're going to push off the, the lead. Um, they're going to push off their lead guy and they're going to overtake the down lineman. And if they can do that in three steps and that's what they do. If in three steps they can't reach and they can't reach that play side hip and get to the aiming point, then they're going to continue on their path up to the linebacker and try to not not. There's a few situations where we can knock out the defensive lineman. But for the most part, a base rule, they're going to take three steps. If you can reach him, reach him. If in three steps you can't, and those first three steps should all be behind the line of scrimmage, those first three steps, if you can't reach him, then continue on your path and your angle up to the linebacker. The backside combination is the exact same thing, right? We're, we're focusing on cutting everything off this entire time that all of our footwork's the same. One of the reasons why I like this play is it doesn't matter if you're the right guard, left guard, left tackle, you're taking the same footwork. It's the same thing for your lead. It's the same thing for your trail. Um, you got a three-step decision if you're the uncovered guy, your trail guy. Um, so it's the same aiming point, play side hip as we get rock and roll through all that. Okay. In terms of our assignments, we use a point system. I'm not going to get too, too in detail with assignments. Um, and I can do that if you guys want to reach out afterwards. If you think this talk is worth anything uh, and you want to communicate with me afterwards, I'd be more than happy to talk more about assignments. But essentially what it boils down to is the center is always going to be going to our point, whoever we identify it. And we have different ways to identify who he's working to. The backside tackle is going to be working to minus one. The play side tackle, if he's got a tight end with him, he's going to be working to plus one with the tight end. If not, if he doesn't have a tight end, then he's probably going to be man on the defensive end by himself. And then the guards, you just do what you're told to do, right? The center's going to come up and make a call. Play side tackle's going to make a call. Backside tackle's going to make a call. Guards, you, you do what you're told to do, right? And that's, that's, that's the way it was taught to me. 
um, O-line play was taught to me back in the day in 2003 when I got to uh, Bowling Green. And that's how I've continued to do it. Now, some of my technique and things like that are going to be have changed in that time, but the, the basis of how we approach things at the LOS are going to be different. So, um, and like I said, we'll get a chance to talk about assignments as we go. Um, so the first thing we do in terms of building the blocks, what I want to talk about is um, really want to focus on how to properly build your blocks from the ground up. One of the, you know, I, I have followed a lot of Charles Bentley. Um, what you'll see from my guys on, on, on the LOS is um, I had the opportunity to coach in the state of Iowa for seven years. Um, I was only an hour and 15 minutes away from the University of Iowa, and I've got a chance to, to watch those guys, went to practice, things like that. And um, I really admire a lot of what they do, and I think they're year in and year out one of the more consistent offensive lines in developing guys that maybe aren't the, the top end recruit. Well, at the Division three level, we don't have guys that are necessarily your top end guys. We got to work to develop them, right? And so I think it's really, I, I really liked what they did. And you know, in terms of talking about the wide zone, one of my best friends from college was uh, an undersized offensive lineman, about 6'2, 295 pounds, um, ended up getting drafted into the Shanahan system with the Broncos and ended up uh, being a seven year starter with the Redskins. Uh, his name's Corey Lichtensteiger. And I got a chance to utilize him as a major resource um, and, and got a chance to bounce ideas off of him about wide zone, got a chance to go out to Washington for a day, uh, got a chance to talk to one of their offensive line coaches about the wide zone play and just what they're doing. And a lot of my philosophy has been built off of those conversations. Um, so you'll see some things that I don't give, I don't I don't care about base. The only thing I care about is a backside hand, backside knee. And then, you know, really stealing from that ability of building from the ground up. And in order for us to move anywhere, we have to push the earth away from us, right? So if I want to take my first step to the right, I've got to drive the earth away from me as hard as possible with my left foot. So the, one of the first things we do in terms of building our blocks is a drill that we call zone, zone get offs. Um, I, I've got some great drill tape from my years past. I didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, it depends on where, what program you're at. Do you have guys to film uh, your, your indie or not? So I, I didn't have a ton of guys to film my indie from this past year, uh, but I do have it from years past. So this is at one of my, my prior coaching stops. But what we're trying to do here is right now in this line over here, he's simulating wide zone to the left. The other line is simulating wide zone to the right. Okay, and what we want to do is want to make sure we're starting off in the knee. We're going to start off behind the cone. This second cone right here is acting as their aiming point. So if you could imagine a defensive lineman in a, in a three-point stance, the X on the left that I just threw is his inside hip. Now this, is, this one here is his play side hip, right? So we want to drive and we want to take and get to this play side hip. So we want to literally run over that cone. I want him to drive, push the earth away from me. You can see his knees inside his ankle, everything we've always talked about for years, knee inside ankle, all those type of power angles. He's there. He's in a good position. I want to see him drive the earth away from him, take his footwork, really isolate and how to, how to force and push the earth away from him and then run over the cone. And you'll see a couple guys. He's a, he was a first team all conference center. This is a sophomore who's still learning, right? So you'll see some of the differences as we go, but this is what we're looking for. I want a nice horizontal first step, right? I want to see it land. I really like the way that foot landed in terms of it's almost at a 45 degree angle. He's on his interior foot, interior footwork. And then his, his second steps getting in the ground as fast as he can. And he's trying to run and we should finish in that position to where we are tip right over that cone is what we're looking for. Right. And we're running through, I'm not looking for any type of waddle action. We're running through. The next guy comes up. You can move it through. Okay, a little bit. He's a little bit show. Um, he's a little bit slow getting his second step down, right? He's just a little bit long with it. He's just a little bit long with it, not quite as good. This next guy up is another senior, a little bit more of a technician, not as explosive. This is one of my favorite drills, too to see with my incoming class, you know, how explosive are you? How good are your hips, right? This next guy up, he's, he's clearly overweight, but he's got some pretty good hips and pretty good power and explosion and it can move okay. 
Obviously, the next guy up, not so much. And so it's a great evaluation tool for me as well. When I get kids on campus, I get a chance to take a look at this and see who can move to the right, who can move to the left, what, what type of explosion do they have, how powerful are they, what type of uh, limited, you know, wasted movement do we have. Again, I love we're driving off that backside foot, driving that backside knee, landing all seven interior cleats in the ground. That allows us to transition vertical into our second step. And then we're getting our, our, our tip over that cone moving forward. So this is one of our base drills that we do with a variety of, of different um, aiming points, right? You can, you can tweak that aiming point based off of where you put that cone, right? So we start off with new kneeling get offs and then we, we transition into zone get offs, right? So now we're gonna be in a two point stance or a three point stance, whatever, whatever I designate for the guys, uh, what we wanna do. But again, the same thing is we wanna develop the understanding of how to move to an aiming point by driving the earth away from the body with our backside leg. Okay. Coach, how much, how much better do you, have you been able to get kids in terms of developing their hips and rolling their hips and things like that? Or, or by the time they get to you, they are who they are. <laughs> so I think it's, you know, athletically, they kind of are who they are. I think all of that development happens in the weight room in their, in their period of time. Um, I, I feel like my job is to get them to better understand their bodies to eliminate wasted movement, if that makes any sense. So, um, you know, I, I'm not one to really talk about the hip snap into the block. I think some of that stuff is, um, you know, a couple of things like if you ever watch the practice of mine, you won't hear me talk about that. I think that's kind of your, the, the nature of the kid and it's that development of how he's you know, kind of getting built in the weight room, both in high school level and the college level. Um, and then I don't talk about uh, pad level either. Uh, to me, it, it, that's a natural thing. That's that's developed in the weight room. Uh, what I talk about is hand placement, um, because the lower your hands are, typically the lower your hips are. Um, but I, I just try to focus on them being efficient in their movements. I really, str I, I, I don't feel comfortable with that development. I, I don't have that knowledge. I don't know if that helps or answers your question at all. Um, but, um, you know, I just work on trying to get them to be more efficient in their movements because I can't change who they are. Um, they are who they are. I just try to get them to be more efficient within their movements. So, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get, um, I'll get, uh, I'll get uh, moving on. So the next aspect, so now we've got our zone get off. So now we're just, you can see we're doing it from a two point. Now, full disclosure, this is not what we would do. This would be if you had a really tight five technique. Um, we're actually doing this as a mid zone aiming point right now, but it really doesn't matter. Wherever you put the cone is where your aiming point is going to be. So for me, if I wanted to do this as wide zone, right, I just move your aiming point a little bit wider because it typically is a little bit wider, but we're looking for the exact same thing. You're looking for that good body position. You're looking to get your seven interior cleats in the ground. You're looking to see your knee inside your ankle, your second step's getting vertical. And I, I as you can see, I want to see them run, right? I want to see, and the big thing I want to see them do in, in 76 years, he always struggled with it. And you guys all have guys that struggle with it too. He really struggled with that transition back vertical, right? And, and, and having that power. And that's where continue to develop in the, in the squat rack and those type of movements. Um, but this is something that we help with. It helps them understand the aiming point. And I think this is what I've been asking my guys to do uh, for the last two, two and a half months during this quarantine. You know, you can understand aiming points. And you, this is this is this is social distancing, you know, approved. You know, this is a this is a big deal for me uh, for those guys that we can get a lot of different work done. And you can see these are this is early in camp. Um, some of the different bodies that are that are in play, how they can move. Um, but this is a big thing for me that I've done consistently um year in and year out and i always talk so uh, guards will be in a three-point stance for us tackles are going to be in two and three and i think it's really important to make sure and i put this clip in there as well we're going to do it out of a three point and we're going to do it out of a two point you, you got to make sure you're practicing what you actually do now 57 was a, a really good player for us ended up being an all-conference selection before i left as a junior um and, and you can see he does a nice job of getting that seven interior cleats. And then it really has the power to be able to drive that knee vertical and transition back vertical. Cause in my opinion, when you start talking about zone and being able to create movement, you can only really create movement when you 
threaten the leverage of the down lineman and then get him to cross over his feet and then come with your backside knee, backside hand. Then you can get some vertical movement. So, um, you know, kind of transitioning into that. Um, now we go to backside knee drive. So the objective. Hey, coach. Is- yeah. Real quick, just a quick question. Uh, KMA yeah. for, for Valley State. Why do you do a wide zone from a knee? But mid zone from a stance. I do them both. I just didn't. I just didn't have uh, have the ability to get them uh, filmed. Okay. You know, so okay. I, I do. I, I do all of my zones from a knee and all of them from a stance. I yeah, guess. Just just a matter of having help and a, an extra guy to film. Sure. You know. So if I was at if I was at a power five, I'd have all of them. <laughs> you okay. Know? Yes, sir. So yeah, but to me, it's interchangeable. Definitely, I, I definitely want them to do it with both. Um, so now backside knee drive, and again, this is the same thing too. I would do the same backside knee drive, mid zone and, uh, and, and wide zone. Okay, it's just you change your aiming points and how you set up the drill. But to me, this is this is to develop an understanding of how to gain and maintain lateral leverage of the defender with your lead foot while driving the backside knee through the defender to create vertical movement. All right, so that that's huge for me. And then the secondary objective, and again, I don't talk about upper body a ton. Because I think in, in, in O-line play, you win with your feet and then you dominate with your hands. Um, but the secondary objective is to develop an understanding of proper hand placement and upper body mechanics. So that whole aiming point that we talked about, now I want to see them start off. So in this drill here, we're actually going to be working wide zone to the left. Okay, so we start off. He's going to he's gonna be in a fit position. He should have his tip on the play side hip. He should be a little bit in front of the defender. His backside hand, which you can't see, is going to be on the sternum, all right? Um, and then what I want to see out of this is on his first step, I want to see a nice lateral first step, make sure he's maintaining that leverage, and then I want to see him drive his backside knee vertical. And and, and, and I tell him essentially knee him in the nuts, right? I want to see him drive that backside knee through the crotch of the defender, and then his third step should be lateral, his fourth step should be vertical, so on and so forth. So his odd numbered steps should be lateral and his even numbered steps should be vertical to try to create that vertical movement. Um, and I do this sometimes you can see, uh, you'll see uh, every now and then the guy behind him is just hitting them in the obliques or trying to get them in the abs. That's just to engage their core, have them have an understanding of how to engage their core and their blocks um, so that they can come out and, and you know, cause you got, we all know, like you could be a 400 pound bencher and a 600 pound squatter, but if your core is weak, you ain't gonna be able to move anybody. They all, the core is what connects everything and gives you an opportunity to move someone. So you'll see it here, get a chance to drive. This is exactly what I'm looking for. And you can see, you know, his first step, he takes a great first step. I like that. He's on a seven interior cleats. He's straining to get vertical. There's a little bit of crossover. I don't give a shit about that. To be honest with you, I don't really care. I want him to get vertical there, there. And then what I want to point out here at the end, you can see him let go with the play side hand. That is taught. That is something I want him to do because if you hold on with your play side hand, you're going to get called for holding, right? The backside hand is the only thing that matters. Nothing. You'll you'll never see me do a a straight line drill anymore, right? My buddy, Corey came to watch me. uh, um, He actually installed a new weight room at this school. Um, He works for powerlift um, in Van Wert and he ended up, uh, he worked, like I said, he played for the Redskins and the, and the Broncos for nine years. And he, one of the, one of his pet peeves that he always talked about, he goes, why do you ever do a straight line drill? Cause I was doing a few things straight line. He goes, why do you ever do that? Because that makes no sense. Football is not a straight line. He goes, it's always an angle, right? So that's one of the things that I, I eliminated because of a conversation that I had for, with him is everything's on an angle. So I want to see him get, Horizontal with his first, lateral with his first step, vertical with his, his his backside knee, and we're running. You can't see the finish here, but we're we're working to finish, right? We're working to finish through ten yards, right? And they're finishing on there. I'm, I was lucky enough this year. I had a uh, a returning player who had to finish up his his degree, um, come back. He was my finishing coach, right? He was my finishing coach. But again, I want to see that good first step. So I, I don't want to see him step underneath himself like he does here. Right. Uh, obviously, that's all stuff that we're working against. But I want to uh, the big focus is the backside knee drive, really having an understanding, having your thumb out, elbow tight and driving the backside knee. I, I, and I'm good with the overemphasizing of it. You can see he's really straining. I really love this kid strain to get his backside knee going here. You can see him straining it. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Um, 
and, and, and pushing through same deal, returning all conference kid really gets it. Um, did a nice job. I'm okay with them. Um, some guys are better at letting go with the play side and others. Obviously you want your tackles to be a little bit better. This kid was a tackle. You want them to be better at, um, letting go than your interior guys. Cause they're the ones that are going to get called for it. Yeah. But I, I do that drill, uh, mid zone. I do it as our, our outside zone. I do it inside zone a little bit with it too, but it's a little bit different. Um, and all I do is I just, I just tweak how they, they start, you know, mid zone, you're trying to knee them in the knee wide zone. You're trying to knee them in the crotch, right? Then we go into our zone progression. Okay. So now we just did our on air stuff. We just did our fit position stuff. Now we're going, now we're starting from a stance and we're going to do our zone progression. I do this every single day. This is an everyday drill. This is a, um, you know, I do this with inside zone, mid zone, wide zone, every single day to the right, to the left. This is a, if you don't do this in practice, something's wrong with coach nice from type drill. Um, and again, now it's to develop an understanding of how to take the proper footwork to get to your proper aiming point on the defender. And it's also develop an understanding of how to place your hands and also replace. Um, one of the things you'll see within this, um, you'll see, you should see the players replace their hands. Um, I stole that, that, that aspect from coach Clark, who was at Illinois state. He's actually at Dubuque now, um, of replacing your hands. Cause very rarely do you ever get your hands in the right place. Um, you know, so we come off the ball, we strike. And when we, when we're not in the right position, we learn to replace our backside hand. And then we re- we learn to place our, our front side hand. So what I'm looking for, I use these T's to help uh, as a guideline for our guys. I want to make sure that first step, this is a great first step. He's stepping to the far foot of the defender, trying to take that angle, trying to get a second step down through the crotch. Probably should be a little bit more vertical on it. But again, now his third step's going more, more lateral. He's replacing his hand, getting into the backside, getting into the sternum. And now we're running through 10. I just rock and roll through it down the line. Obviously, everyone's drill setup is going to be different depending on uh, the number of kids you have, the amount of space you have. Um, you know, if you have lines, if you don't have lines, the first three guys that went through were pretty solid. You can see the fourth kid's a freshman here about the third day at camp. He's a little short of his aiming point, right? So we just continue to work. Backside cutoff, same deal. And I think this is a great clip by 57. You can see him replace his left hand right there. That's exactly what we're looking to do. And I think that's one of the keys in being successful with the block, but also not getting it called um, with a lot of different uh, penalties, right? Not getting holding calls here. And again, you can see it's pretty consistent across the board. To me, this is a pretty good clip where the first two, these two almost look identical, right? And to me, it's a beautiful thing when you're running this play successfully, you should have your offensive linemen should look almost in sync with their forward. But we go this play to the right. We keep working them to the left. And, and again, this is an everyday thing. I, I use these PVC uh, piping deals every single day, right? Now we're working wide zone to the left. Everyone's working your, your base aiming points. Um, and then we work, um, we continue to move. But again, this is an everyday. This is how we start off practice. This is what we do pregame. Because I think how you start pregame should be how you start practice because you're, you're just mentally getting your kids um, ready to go. So I hope the video playback's okay. Um, I did the video optimization, um, hoping that it would work. Hey, Coach, oh. I, had, I had a question for you. Actually, like one of my buddies, yeah. instead of typing it, he's he just texted me instead. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, if you get a chance, ask him how the aiming point hand placement might change if it was a definite get out side play versus wide zone where the running back can cut up if the DN stretches. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't change it too much. Um, to me, I, I don't know if I would necessarily change the aiming points for that. I would change my uh, point identification and, and give you a little bit better angle um, with working interior to the box, like where that tackle tight end combination would go. And I'd probably have a lead back for the alley defender. Um, if I wanted to truly get to the perimeter. Um, but in terms of, uh, of getting outside to the perimeter with this, um, I, I don't know if you could go much farther than the play side hip to me, if I wanted to truly get it to the perimeter, 
I would change the blocking scheme to where that force or alley defender I would take care of with either a receiver or a, um, a uh, fullback or of some sort or a second tight end. And then a tackle tight end combination could work to your first line, but you just get better angles. And now you can be a little bit thicker. The lead guy could be a little bit thicker on his uh, path to the linebacker, if that makes any sense. That's perfect, so, Coach. But, Thank you. Yeah. But hey, to Coach, me, before you move on, yeah. well, what's your uh, measurements on your PVC pipe there? Oh, man. I, uh, I think I want to say it's like three feet, four. They're all different. You can tell because they get they get broken in the cold weather. Oh, uh, I can I can believe that. <laughs> so I think to me, I found this this piece here has to be at least like two and a half or three feet. This has to be okay, like two and a half or three feet and then four that's feet. What it I mean, like. it's a little bit big, but the cool thing about it is you can make it for like 10 bucks. Oh, no doubt. You know, and Thanks. and I, and it's and it's something the kid. it's a good visual. And it, to be honest with you, it's for the kids, but it's also for me. Like it helps me know if they've overstepped um, moving forward. And, and this is our wide zone. And if it was mid zone, we'd just be going tip to tip, far foot, near foot. Same drill all the time, over and over again. Um, I, I can't do this drill enough. Our players probably can. They probably hate it, but just like every drill you hate, it's probably a good one. Um, coach, coach, I, I yeah. saw a guy from Louisiana Lafayette use towels in the yep. same way you had the PVC pipe. Yeah. And, um, and you know, and hell, towels are free, and you step on those, you can't break them. Yeah. You know, I thought that was a pretty interesting approach. Yeah. I See, I, I do the PVC pipe because they're easier to move around. And, it, and sure. I don't have a manager to set it up for me. So we got to get those things on, get them off really, really quickly. Um, yep. Makes complete sense. And the, the towels are good too, because you don't have a risk about like stepping and sliding on it at all, which yep. happens very few times, but it, it's still a risk you want to try to avoid. Um, so from the, the, so from the zone progression aspect, now we go to the linebacker strike. Okay. Now it's just how to get up, how to the proper angle to get to a second level blocker, right? Second level defender. Same thing. We start on the tees and we work and we're working up to it again. My buddy Corey was the best at going up to second levels. All I want to see is I want to see them come off the ball, right? The same footwork as if you were going to a down lineman. The biggest thing I want to see is when you go to that, when you go to approach that linebacker, I want to see three things. I do want to see a slight widen of the base. I want to see you drop your hips a little bit, right? There's four things. I want to see you bring your hands from low to high, but the biggest thing I want to see is I want to see you accelerate through. I want to see you accelerate through the linebacker. I don't give a shit if you fall on your face. I want to see you accelerate through the linebacker, right? That's the biggest thing that I want to see. Now we're working to try to just get tip to tip, give the, the back a two-way go on this one. Um, but th that's all I'm looking for. And, and you can see some guys emphasize it a little bit more than others. But that to me is an every day we go zone progression. We'll start off zone get offs, zone progression, linebacker strike and then we'll move into some of our our um, zone combo drills that we do but again it's the same footwork i want to see acceleration tight hands low to high and accelerate through and you can see i i really don't care about the base of the offensive lineman and my, my philosophy behind that is um and i'll get moving because I, I just saw the time my philosophy behind that is you can only throw me off the block if I'm not driving into you enough, if I'm running and I'm driving into you and you're back on your heels, you can't throw me off that block. And if you do, we're both going down and I win. Right. So I, I don't give a shit about that. So now zone combination is really just developing an understanding of proper footwork, aiming points, timing, necessary to effectively gain leverage and handle D line movement. So just like everyone else is doing, now you're just doing your two main games, right? So now we're working a, a combination outside zone. He's working to the play side hip. He's working three steps to get to the play side hips behind the line of scrimmage. He's got a three-step decision. If he can get there, get there. If he can't, continue on his path up. It's all we're looking for. Uh, mix in different line movements. Be the same deal. This is a, a nice look. You can see. I'll slow it down a little bit. Um, so hopefully it's not choppy over on your end there. But you can see he's taking one, two, three. He's eyeing that hip. Third step, I can't reach him. Now I'm climbing and I'm getting up to my... I'm getting up to my backer while well, the, in, in the, the lead guy knows in three steps, if he hasn't been pushed off, he now has the down lineman, right? So there's that three, three step process in it as well to a little less skilled guys, 
Um, but it's the same deal. One, two, three, climb, get up to your linebacker. Would like to see him replace his backside hip or backside hand. But now it's the same thing. Same drill. Now we're just working backside. Okay. Working a little different movements. One, two, three, climb, get to your backside. Now we're working cut off. I'm not going to try to kill my guys on this drill. Um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. I don't know. Some years it's better than others. Um, but I want to make sure I got my best five and seven going into the games. But very up, you know, three technique pinching, two eye pinching, exchanging gaps, just to work on the different um, timing of everything. Right now, this is a center and a backside guard combination with it. Linebacker hits it running, being aware, checking the hip of the down lineman. It goes away, get your eyes up to your linebacker and be ready to fit. So that's really, and now we get a chance. Now it's tackle tight end combination, same situation, three steps to overtake, can't overtake, climb, right? The one. So, and to me, between these things, that, that is all you do is, is, is zone get offs, zone progression, linebacker strike, and, um, um, zone combination. So now we're working. This would be the left tackle and left and a tight end are working up to 25. Now it's actually game application coming in place, right? I'd like to see the tight end probably can get a little bit more vertical up the field here, but I think it's a great job of showing now this is the offensive line that was really good at running power. You can see we're pretty big on the left side, um, but we, we still had to have this play in. Okay. But it's a good job of running by the left tackle and you'll see he gets his backside hand to the sternum and then let's go. Like, I think that's the most important part. He's able to let go. That allows us to get to the perimeter and a really, really dynamic running back allows us to score a touchdown. Um, and I, one thing, you know, I, for me, I think the best thing to do is have, have really good running backs for this play to be really good. Any play, I'm a really good offensive lineman when I have good running backs. Um, that's what I've learned in my coaching career. So same situation here is, you know, we're working the tight end to the nine technique Right again, we have a good good guard. I'm okay with this. The tight end of the nine technique, we're working the tackle to the nine technique up to the 70 linebacker. He's got a three step decision, right? He can't reach that nine technique in three steps. He's going to climb on up to the linebacker, and now it's a difficult fit on the safety who actually have the fullback who, who really should ins insert inside of that one up to the safety to give us a chance. But again, it's, to me, it's all the play side, uh, play side hip aiming point. Um, and it really doesn't matter if it's tackle tight end, if it's guard tackle. It really doesn't matter who you're working with. So now we have an example here of play side guard, play side tackle working. He's working to the play side hip of this down lineman. They're working up to 30. The tight end's going to take 23 by himself. But we're going to work that play side guard and tackle combination up. And you can see the line movement. This is part of that zone combo that we do. Um, we'll work this combination all the time, but <clears throat> he's stepping far foot crotch at the right tackle. He goes inside, keep your outside hand free, get up to the play side hip of the linebacker. And now we've created a, a solid edge. I'd like to see a better finish um, from the guard, but I mean, you guys all know, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Excuse, hey, excuse me, coach. Is that yeah. difference in um, reading the hip or reading the knee? Probably not. I've just I've just always done the hip because that's what I was taught in 2003. I got you. And I'm just the opposite. I was always taught read the knee. Knee comes to you, take it. Knee goes away. Climb on that third yeah. step. You know, the only the only the only advantage of reading the hip, I would think, is that Shakira's got a song about it. <laughs> the hips don't lie. <laughs> So I got you. that might be the only advantage to it. Um, it's just, you know, to me, that goes back to just being comfortable with it. Gotcha. So here's an example from this past year. Okay, so you get a chance. Um, this is now guard and center. Okay, the, the right guard and the center are working up to 56. And here's an example of just running. Right, it's a really, really nice job with the right guard getting to the play side hip, getting his backside hand, and running to finish 
on the block as he goes to extend. I think it's a really nice job. You can see the center too, right? He's taking one, two, three. He can't reach him in three steps. You see his eye snap up to the linebacker, and he's going to strain to do whatever he can to get to the play side hip and get us out to the perimeter, All right, as much as we can. Um, and I like the carry over front side, back side is the same. Um, I don't have a ton of because we only ran this play. Uh, we only ran wide zone last year. It was more of an outside zone 13 times. Um, so there's really a uh, limited, limited looks of it. So now again, we're watching the center and the left guard in this clip. It's the same clip that we had earlier, um, but it's a really nice job. And you can see the eyes you can watch. First off, watch the left guard, get his backside hand to the sternum, play side hip, his tip to the play side hip and run it without his lead hand, right? He's definitely not going to get called for holding because he doesn't have his lead hand in the block. It's all about the backside hand and him getting there to the perimeter, right? I think it's a great job at the center position here. He takes his three steps. He can't reach him in three steps. He gets his eyes up to the linebacker, goes to climb. He tries to come underneath him. Hey, we'll go ahead and put the brakes on him. We got him. And again, it allows us to get to the perimeter and we score the touchdown on that on, on that play. Again, this is the same clip. It's, it's always a nice thing when, when plays work um, well and you have multiple good examples as, as you're working through to it. So this is a good example here. If you watch the, the center and the right guard, you know, that, that's – So the center and the right guard in this last clip here, same situation, right? They're going to work a combination up. I want to see that right guard get to the play side hip, see that center get to the play side hip. He's got a three-step decision. If he can reach him, he can reach him. Okay, and then he's going to push the guard up to this linebacker here, right? That's what we're looking to see out of it. Okay, it's a great job running. And, and the biggest thing with any type of zone play, in my opinion, any mid zone or wide zone or whatever, you want to try to create as many combinations as possible, right? I think it's a great job by both the right guard and the center of getting to their aiming points. Now the, the, the right guard loses it on the linebacker, but it was a great job of reaching that three technique, the center reaching that three technique and going. And obviously when you have athletic guys, it's going to be a, a pretty successful play for you. Um, another example here, same situation, center and right guard. Now we've, we've, we've got poor leverage here. Okay, we've got poor leverage. So this is kind of one of those deals. If you had a lead back and I wanted to really make sure that we got to the perimeter, I would I would change it. I would change the way we, we termed it. And I would take that tackle and tie it in. And I would take their block into 41, bring the center and guard back to 10 and have the lead blocker on that on that force alley defender and then not block your play side safety. That's how I would make sure that that's what I would do to try to ensure that we would get to the perimeter. Um, but here we're not doing that. We're sending the, we're sending the uh, safety up to uh, we're sending the fullback up to the lead safety. So now we're looking, it's a great job. I think again, of the center and the guard working to get to the aiming points, running, really understanding that we are running. We're not, we're not waddling off the ball. We're running. Obviously I'd like to have that. When they cut back, they cut back. I mean, at the end of the day, I'll take a seven-yard, eight-yard game when they cut back like that. Same situation. It's a really nice job by the center and the left guard. Nice job by the left guard initially, right? Keeping his play side hand off it. Great job by the center. Obviously, the angle's got to be improved a little bit by the uh, by the left guard up to that linebacker. It's also a great job of, if you look at it, the left tackle, he's on a base block. He's by himself. This is that zone progression drill showing up. He's going far foot cross, get his backside hand to the sternum, and he's running, right? That, that It's a great job by a lot of guys. Obviously, you need a slightly better angle up to that linebacker, but the initial combination that we've been working – is is really good here so now you, it now it's the same deal on the backside. the combinations are all the same the way i teach it um, i want to try to keep the game as simple as possible um, i don't want to over complicate it at all um, you know so I, I i i try to keep it the same and then as you guys know 
you know, you might have your left guard playing right guard next week. You might have your right tackle playing center next week. And we ended up this uh, center actually started the first seven games at center, started two at left tackle, and then went back to center. You know, it's we were all over the place, but the 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 way I teach it, I think it's it's relatively the same. So now these two are working out in their combination. We're working the center and left guard up to number four, and I want to see it again. Lead guys play side hip, trail guys play side hip. Trail guys got three steps to make a decision on whether or not he can overtake the defensive lineman. If he can do so, do it. Lead guys get in a hand. His play side hand is free. Don't get it involved. Make a push call, get him off. Get a nice little, nice little cut at the second level. They should, they should not restrict that, that type of block, in my opinion. Okay, same situation. Now we're in a three-man front. So now we're going to be working a tackle guard combination up to 46. The tight end is the one who's going to be by himself, right? We're going to work a center and backside guard combination to 39, right? It's a, it's a really nice job by the center and the backside guard. He's coming off three steps. I can't reach him. Now I'd like him to not push him off because I think he hurts the center's block there, but I, I can't reach him. I'm going to continue up to my linebacker and get up to Miami point. Obviously, it's a great job. It's a great cut. It's a great job by the center of running them by and finishing. You know, and that's the thing that I like. You know, once you once you threaten Amy points, like we won on ninety three. He just crossed over. We won. He will take. We'll take him anywhere we we want to go with him. Right. That 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 to me is the advantage uh, of running running zone. And that's why I'm okay with us crossing over and doing some of those things. Um, is because when we get when we force their leverage, when we when we threaten their leverage, they're forced, um, they're they're forced to cross over their feet, and then we can get some vertical movement. This is actually um, more of a mid zone play, so I won't talk about that. And then backside guard, backside tackle, um, it's the same thing. If we were on the backside of a pin and pull scheme for us here, um, our technique, it's the same thing. If we were backside of mid zone, right? It, it doesn't change for us. And this is actually a mid zone play, but I wanted to show it as I, these two are working play side hip of the down lineman play side hip of the down lineman three steps decision to make that to make that call and we are running through the play side hip now of the three technique and the linebacker and to me when we run off the ball we aggressively get up on linebackers we can force them to make poor decisions the quicker we can get to them Here's an example of us running a, um, this is more mid zone too. This next one's more your wide, our wide zone. So same deal, right? Well, this is actually a pin and pull scheme. This one here, right? This is a pin and pull scheme. The way we identified it, we're working a center, a left guard, left tackle combination, the linebacker right there. You want to talk about some shitty ass leverage. Okay. But we're going to run off the ball run to the play side hip of the defender, stay balanced, get our backside hand to the sternum and get them cut off, right? And, and having an understanding of our guys too and, and knowing that you're working and you can keep your play side hand free. It's a nice stab by the left guard for us to get out to the perimeter, like the center to block somebody for crying out loud. So to me, one of the one of the great things about this play is you are consistently doing it over time. We saw this play earlier. Now it's a backside guard, backside tackle, working through the play side hip of the down lineman. Three steps to make a decision to take over, push your buddy off. Okay. Understanding the biggest thing in understanding these guys, especially on the backside, is the backside the, the, both guys being aware of how much help the lead. Can, can help right the point of attack is over here I need to take make sure I'm taking that angle here to meet the linebacker right and that in the backside tackle in this position here he needs to understand he ain't going to get much help he's got to he's got to get some depth to that far foot of the defender and he's got to run like heck right to get there and understand that he'll be gone right now if if, if the minus one was back here well, now we have a little bit more help 
with your with your guard and understanding the leverages of the linebackers and the defenders and where they're at and how it affects how much help your buddy's going to give you. I think that's one of the biggest things in working those zone combos. When you talk about that individual, that drill time is allowing those guys to truly understand it. And you can see like in no way, shape or form would anybody teach that to be a good football position. It's my personal opinion that good football positions don't really exist on the backside of zone. They, they, I don't think they exist. I think if you're trying to make, if a guy's trying to stay in a good football position on the backside to do a backside cutoff, I don't think he'll ever make his block. I think he's going to be short of it almost every single time, and he's going to miss his aiming point, and his guy's going to beat him and be able to make a play. Right? And this is a nice job of the, of the guard getting up again and working to his aiming point and running. And again, he's not the most athletic guy. He's 320 pounds. You can see he's got a little bit of a gut on him, but he was, he was efficient enough in his movements to be able to execute these blocks. So um, I have a few more examples, um, different, different uh, formations, different sets. Um, to me, you can run this out of 20 personnel. You can run it out of 10 personnel. You can run it out of 20. You can do a lot of different things if you have a fullback to create some double teams. Um, and, and again, that to me is, is the biggest thing in this block is to try to find a way within this scheme to get double teams for everybody involved, right? I mean, it's especially the play side tackle, in my opinion. He, he's the one who he needs to be in a double team um, at all times to feel really good. Um, in fact, this left tackle, he was all conference this past year as a freshman for us. He's really good, free kid, okay? But he would constantly ask for a combination. You know, can, can I get guard help? Give me guard help. Give me guard help. Or if he had a tight end, he'd be good too. Um, but this is a great example here of him working that zone progression of taking far foot, crotch, getting to that play side hip, and working to get to the play side hip, get his backside hand to the sternum and work to finish a block while running. You'll see he's, he's going to cross over and I don't care, right? All, that's the position that I want to see is him in that position. We we've got it. We're good. We've won. You can, you can do a lot of things with wide zone and your perimeter and how you block the perimeter. You can send the fullback out to the corner and you can crack and you can do a whole bunch of fun stuff with that. Those are a bunch of variations that you can play around with. Right. You can play around with your fullback comboing with a tight end. You can play around with your fullback comboing with a center. You can do a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, but to me, you know, it's about consistently getting the aiming points. When you do that at the play side, you're going to have a ton of success. Right. We're, we're decent at the guard. Not great um, in terms of getting up to the linebacker. That's a great I like I love that right there. Yeah, that's a great job. Now continue to work up and just continue that angle up to that, up to that backer, right? Continue that angle up to that backer and we'll be in, in, in great shape. So, but you can, again, there's just a bunch of variations of formations that you can run it out of. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some, there's some ugly here too. I mean, you can see one of the biggest things is continuing to coach your running backs on pressing the aiming point doing everything in their power to do so because a lot of times they want to cut back and that's where you get in a lot of trouble. Like to me, man, we've got almost everything we want. You know, the center reached the three technique, the guards in great position, the tackle while he didn't reach the defensive end, he took the defense again. And this is against UW whitewater. Okay, he took the defensive end, you know, and ran his, and ran them to the opposite upright. We're in a good position here continue your path. Yeah, we didn't do a great job as a backside tackle, but continue your path there and press it as opposed to cutting back in to everybody else. Well, we're not blocking for those guys. We're blocking for the play side hip. We want to get everything cut off, right? Again, you can do it out of two by twos. You can do it out of three by ones. I think there's a great job here of the center working to a four eye combination by the, the, the or I'm not sorry, the, the right guard and the right tackle working up, getting to that play side hip, down on the goal line. This doesn't have to be just an open field play. It can be a goal line play. It can be a third down play. If you stay on your path, you trust it. 
if you rep your if you rep your um, your indie enough for the guys that have an understanding of their aiming points, you can do this against anything, right? Now you're in a three by one. Again, <coughs> I just I mean I I personally I'm a zone guy through and through. But again, now here's an example. I think the running back's too tight here, right? And, and again, I think he's. I mean, you guys would all see it too. He's too tight. But to me, when you can get those defensive linemen running and crossing their feet over, you might not get a ton of vertical movement, but we're taking guys from the middle of the field. You know, that three techniques in the middle of the field, and now he's outside the hash, right? And it's a nice job. This would be a, a time where the center, you can't get there in three. You can knock him out, climb to your linebacker. I don't care that his guy gets a hit on it because the back's the wrong path. Right. He's a little bit tight on that one. Three by one nubs. I mean, there's opportunities all over the place for, again, continue to press. What I'd like to see here, and this is big for running backs, in my opinion, is now I don't know why the, the right guard left the center. The center probably had a, a little too much bravado and thought he could reach him by himself. But right here, as you're coaching this play up for your backs too, okay, we gave up some, but get back on your path, get back on your angle, dip underneath that center and get back on your angle. We'll have a, a better play than what, what we did. Right. So that's, it's a consistent battle with some of those guys as you're moving forward, um, working with, you can be three by one with your tight ends off the ball on the backside. You can be three by one with your tight ends off the ball front side. Um, you can go on balance with it. I mean, it's it, it very, um, very multiple play. Guys, I love it because if you're going to try to take bad passes as a linebacker and try to duck underneath stuff, you, you know, you run this play away from a, a, a field or a boundary blitz, to me, you should be having a freaking field day. You should be having a ton of success on it. Um, you know, it's just a couple different ways to do it. It hits, like I said, it's a very difficult play to fit because it can hit a little bit backside, right? If you get guys running enough and you have enough patience, you press your aiming point, you get things cut off on the backside, you can, you can hit the, this play can hit anywhere against anybody. Um, and anybody can do it too. You can get a chance here. This is a nightmare situation against one of the top teams in the country where my starting center goes out with full body cramps. I put my right guard in that center my backup right guard gets hurt and I've got my four string guard in at right guard right now. And we're able to continue to run off the ball, get guys cut off, have success. Um, don't get up to the linebacker. doesn't matter. We can still get the ball up the perimeter and, and have some success. How am I doing on time? Coach, we're about out an hour. So, I mean, I mean, kind of wrap up with what you need and then like yeah. so we'll answer any loose questions. Um, try to probably wrap this up in the next 10 to 12 minutes or so. Yeah. Well, I'll just, this will be the last, I just have a bunch of different examples. I'm wearing a three by one nub, uh, with it. There's, there's, I mean, there's not much else to it in my opinion, but to me, I, I think the lower body aiming points help with us running off the ball helps with us. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not dumb enough to know having a really good running back or two helps a lot. Um, and then, you know, one of the things too, I think running off the ball helps with finishing blocks too. Guys are able to run and finish and get guys on the ground because they're accelerating their feet and doing something that's natural to them as being in a squat position um, and coming off the ball. This will be the last one I show. This is a great job by the running back. This is what I taught, what I wanted to do on that previous clip. We don't get him reached. Okay. We don't get him reached, but he gets back on his path. And he's able to get back out to the perimeter on his path, and 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 have a heck of a have a heck of a run. It's a nice finish by the center too. So, um, I'll go back to the main title slide. I, I got a, a bunch of those examples, but um, I'll go back to the title slide to have my email pop up again. Um, but I, I really appreciate your time, man. I know uh, it was a chaotic time here today for the Ohio coaches that. Uh, at uh, 2.30, the, uh, the news gets dropped on, on what the restrictions are going to be or moving forward into the weight room and being the chance to, to work out with you guys for the first time in a long time. So I, I appreciate everybody getting the chance to, to come in and take a look at this and take a peek. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email me. My email is right there at the bottom. Uh, 
my cell phone too. You can reach out to me via a text message or just give me a call. Um, I'll say that twice here so the guys can write it down if they want to, but that's 815-540-0114. Uh, um, once again, that's 815-540-0114. And I'd love to have you guys have an opportunity to come up to John Carroll. If you're ever in the Cleveland area, this place is freaking awesome. You know, like I said, I, I didn't know much about John Carroll before I got here. Um, you know, I just gone to Bowling Green. I had figured out that Cleveland was North Columbus was central and Cincinnati was South. And, um, you know, now my main recruiting territory is Columbus. Um, you know, I'm living in Cleveland. I married a Cincinnati girl. So I pretty much got the trifecta down. Um, but, um, you know, just, in uh, we got a great thing going up here with love. If, if you're in the area and you want to come visit, we'd love to have a chance to get an um, opportunity to sit down and visit. Um, you've got a great thing going up here. These kids are impressive. And I, these are some of the most impressive kids I've ever been around. And, um, you know, we work them hard on the field. We work them hard academically. Um, but those kids go out and do the right thing and, and serve the community and do everything they possibly can to be future leaders. And it's, um, it's fun, man. It, it, it really is. So if you guys are ever in the area, I'd love to get a chance to sit down and visit with you and, and see what I can learn from you. And, 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 and you know, uh, move the game forward in a positive direction. Hopefully we're all, hopefully we're all on pace to get, get a full schedule in, in the fall. Um, I think that's what everybody wants right now. So again, thanks for your time. If you guys ever need anything, feel free to reach out to me in any way, shape or form.